Everyone, what I'm going to do is just a quick recap of what a system schema is and a force diagram. Really, a system schema is trying to sum up what a scenario is in just a few words, drawing a couple circles around things that are interesting in the scenario. Those are the systems. How they're connected is the schema, and all forces, all interactions connect one object to the other. Then we have our list of forces that you can do for each of those interactions. They're, they're going to be the force of gravity. There can be the force of tension in a rope. There can be applied forces from engines or people. There could be a frictional force from two things when they're sliding against each other on the ground. And there could be a perpendicular support force. So the support force from a surface, from water, from anything that's trying to make sure that one object doesn't go through another. One of these five objects you can put on the lines depending on what your interaction is so in our scenario here for the ball the floor and the earth if the ball is rolling across the ground we said that earth and the ball are connected by gravity and so is the floor and the earth and what the floor is doing to the ball is the ball is being supported now if the ball and the floor were interacting with friction you'd throw an extra arrow in there or an extra line to connect them and add that other force. The whole point of this is that you want to focus, identify the interactions and then focus on the star. So in this case, if I was focusing on the ball, I see there are two things touching the ball, the support and the gravity. So that's when I draw a force diagram. So let's look at a few of those examples right now. So this first example from one of your worksheets was a skydiver. Skydiver was descending at a nice steady pace. So we put diver as one of the things of interest. Uh, they are above the earth. So we'll put the earth in there as well. Uh, there was a parachute that was holding on to them. And if you want, we can put in the air, causing the parachute to be tight. Again, our focus is going to be on the diver itself. So the air looks like it's a little further removed from the diver itself, but let's cause interactions here. Let's see how everyone's connected. Earth always has its hands in and on everything with the force of gravity, so you can connect everybody with a G. Uh, the air is causing a friction or a drag or some kind of resistance on the parachute, and the parachute then gets tight and causes tension in the rope to slow that person down. So here's my system schema. You can see the picture of the object over on the other side. What we want to do now is focus on the diver and see how many interactions are on him. And I see that there's only two interactions on him, so I'm going to replace the diver with a dot and then draw my force arrows. So I've got a down arrow from the force of gravity and I'll make the up arrow from the tension, blue. So I've got two forces here, one down, one up. You want to make sure you label them and call this force of gravity of earth acting on the diver. And this is the force of tension of the parachute acting on the diver. So we want to label what force it is and who is acting on whom. So in this case, we got gravity and tension. Now, what do we know about those forces? Well, we know this diver is moving down at nice, steady speed. So he's no longer picking up speed. He's cruising towards the ground. And if that's the case, the velocity is constant and the acceleration is zero. So if that's the case, that means that these forces here must be balanced. When we have a constant velocity scenario, we need to balance our forces so the down force and the up force are equal. Even though he's moving downwards, the forces balance each other out. Let's try another scenario. Okay, so in this scenario, we have got the ball and we've got the earth. So what, someone had to throw the ball up in the air, but we're past that point. We're just to the point where the ball is heading up in the air and losing speed every single second. So right off the bat, I know that my velocity is changing with time and there must be an acceleration against that motion. Well, why is that? Well, how does the ball interact with Earth? Through the force of gravity again. 
And again, the ball was who I'm focusing on. So I replace the ball with a dot. Say so there's the ball. And I add in a force that is touching the ball. And the only force is the force of gravity in my schema. So I will add one arrow to my force diagram. That would be the force of gravity of earth acting on ball. So you have to ask yourself, well, are we balanced or unbalanced in this scenario? We can know for a couple of reasons. One reason is that we do see an acceleration this time. So since an acceleration is present, we've got to be unbalanced in our forces. And since we're unbalanced in our forces, you can look back to your schemas and your force diagrams and see that there's only one interaction with the ball, and that force is a downward force. So with that one interaction, I do see an unbalance in forces, and the object must accelerate. It accelerates in the direction of the unbalance. In this example, we've got the kid on a swing and the parents pulling them back. So we want to focus on kid. Uh, a rope's involved for the swing. We've got the parent pulling back the child. And obviously everybody's here on Earth unless we move the scenario to Jupiter or another planet. Right now we're on Earth. So how is everybody interacting with each other? Well, gravity, we said, always has its hands in on everything. So there's the gravitational interaction. Uh, the parent was pulling on the kid, so we could call that an applied force with their arms. And the rope was causing tension for the kids sitting on the swing. So again, there looks like my system schema. I've identified all the forces. There was no friction involved. There was no support force from the ground. There is support on the parent, but really I want to focus on the kid on the swing. So the kid is my star, and I see three interactions with the kid. So I'm going to replace the kid with a dot again, and I want to identify my forces. First one that we always like to identify is the downward force of gravity. So gravity is pulling the kid down towards Earth. The rope, we'll put it in red here, is pulling off at an angle. So if you look at that right now, I've got a tension force from the rope. That's the rope on the kid. I've got the force of gravity of Earth on the kid. And right off the bat here, I can see that this is unbalanced. Well, the scenario says they pulled the kid back but haven't released them yet. So the kid is at rest. And if you're at rest, you're not accelerating. So if we're not accelerating, that means that all my forces need to balance out again. Well, right now, I see only two forces that are balanced. But the parent's applying a force. And let's have the parent pull straight back on the kid. So here's the applied force from the parent on the kid. So are we balanced now? Well, it might be obvious that we are balanced, but here's how you can prove it. I see a down force and a force to the right. That means that if I look at my tension force, my tension force is at an angle. My tension force goes a little bit to the left, and my tension force goes a little bit up. So we can break that angled force into these two pieces, these horizontal and vertical pieces. And what I can see now is that the downward force of gravity is equal to that up piece in the rope's tension. <coughs> and the applied force from the parent is equal to the left force from the tension, the angled component of the tension. So we are balanced in this scenario. We've got a left force, we've got a right force, we've got an up force, we've got a down force. Once we've broken that angled force into those two pieces, you really don't even need that angled force anymore. We know that we're balanced, and we can see that those pieces cancel out and make sure the object does not move. Let's try one more of these angled force examples. Okay, so we've got the skier, the earth, and the hill. Some people like to not put in the hill and just call it skier and earth because you're actually skiing on our planet. 
But sometimes if people like to separate and show the hill in there, I'm fine with that too. Schemas are all what you make them. So we obviously know this interaction. It's always the force of gravity. What's the hill doing? Well, you're not falling through the hill, so the hill must be supporting you. So we'll replace the skier again with a dot and label our forces. Always put our force of gravity straight down and the support from the hill now points off like this. It's always perpendicular to the surface and if you think the surface is flexing, so when the surface flexes it's trying to push back because of that weight you're putting on it. And it's always going to push back perpendicular to its surface. So that's why we call support forces perpendicular forces. So we've got this as the support from the hill on the skier and obviously this is the force of gravity of earth on the skier but in this scenario the skier was going down at nice steady speed and we've seen before that if we're going at steady speed that means we're not accelerating that means we're not accelerating and if we're not accelerating my forces need to be balanced and right now it doesn't look like we're balancing out but as you go down the hill think of the force of friction the force of friction is going to try and resist the skier from going down the hill so you want to put one more interaction here for the force of friction and we'll add one more arrow in and friction would go against your motion down the hill. So we can say alright if that's the force of friction of the hill acting on the skier we can balance this one of two ways. We can balance it just like we did for the kid. We can say that there is a left force and a right force due to these angled pieces and there's an up force here and an up force there and show that everybody balances but there's another way to do it and it may not be the obvious one but we always draw our XY plane like we do in math class X and Y X horizontal and Y vertical but when you have an angled hill well, the problem we run into is we get to those angled forces but what you could do is tilt your head and tilt your plane to be like this. And now we have the y-axis perpendicular to the plane. And we have the x-axis parallel to the plane of the hill. And if you look at that, we've got two forces on the axis. We've got friction and we've got support. The only angled force now is gravity. And if gravity is our only angled force, what that lets us do is break gravity into two pieces. We've got gravity that is parallel with the hill and gravity that's perpendicular with the hill. So once we have gravity broken into its two parts or components, what we can say is that we can see a balanced scenario now. Gravity that is pointing down the hill is canceled out by friction and gravity going into the hill is canceled out by support and we're balanced once more. So think about it. If forces are balanced, the object moves at nice steady speed. But if they're not balanced, what if there was no friction from the hill? Well, that would eliminate this interaction between the hill and the skier, and that would eliminate this force. And if you look at my force diagram now, we are unbalanced. The support and the gravity into the hill cancel out, but there's still extra force pointing down the hill trying to make us accelerate. So look over all the scenarios we did from the two worksheets in class, and good luck.